Uh, my name is Blaine Bettinger. I'm a blogger at thegeneticgenealogist.com. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited and interested in the possibilities of the future of genetic genealogy. What I think is so interesting is that seeing the, the incredible increase in test takers over the past few years and watching it continue to increase opens up a lot of possibilities for the future of genetic genealogy, particularly what we're able to do once, say, 5 million people have tested or 10 million people have tested. It's incredible to think about what we can do with that. So, for example, we can recreate the genomes of our ancestors. We can learn what they looked like. What, how tall they may have been, what their eye color was, what their hair color was, all sorts of really interesting things about what uh, our ancestors may have looked like and how they may have, um, uh, what illnesses they may have had, all kinds of great things we can learn from their reconstructed genomes. We, once we have these reconstructed genomes, we can then use them to potentially recreate family trees based on DNA alone. Um, and I think that's really exciting because so many of us have gaps in our family trees that once we have a great way to really supplement those gaps using DNA, that, that will also be an incredibly powerful tool. So I think there's a lot of, of different things. With reconstructed genomes, with, with segments and DNA assigned to ancestors, we can do things like better cousin matching, um, all sorts of, of very powerful things in the future. So the thing I think has been the most exciting by far, without question, is autosomal DNA. So when I started doing genetic genealogy, it was just Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And certainly they have a very, very vital and important role. But I think the real discoveries that are going to be made over the next few years, the real power, uh, uh, the real change in genetic genealogy is just continuing to have more and more autosomal DNA testing. More people learning about more ancestors. With Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, you're learning about one line. But with autosomal DNA, you're potentially examining any one of your, your recent lines. And so there's a lot, of, a lot more power in autosomal DNA in that way. Autosomal DNA is also harder and trickier than Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And I think that's also one of the problems that genetic genealogy is facing in terms of when we got a Y-DNA result or a mitochondrial DNA result, it was sort of an, an end product. You got answers with that right away. But with autosomal DNA, that's, that's not where we are today. We have a very beginning science with autosomal DNA. And so when you get your results back, it's unfair to expect that that's the final answer. The answer that you get with autosomal DNA today may change. For example, it will change when more people test, when we have a greater database of people, it, it will all change. For the better, things are going to continue to get better and better, but it's, it's unreasonable at this point to get your results back and expect to have all of your questions answered. And, and where's the fun in that? You don't want all your questions answered right away. You want to um, have more to do and, and you want to have more questions to answer. And certainly if you get your DNA tested, you're going to have a lot more questions to answer, but I think that's the fun. Certainly, autosomal DNA will continue to change because first and foremost, more people will test. And with more people to test, you, you learn more about your ancestry, you're going to get closer matches, um, ethnicity reports will get better, all, of, all different types of things will improve once more people have tested. Not only more people have tested, but the, the tools will be more powerful, there will be new tools that are developed to answer the types of questions we have. and so. Really, it's, it's just because we're in such the early phase of, of autosomal DNA that this is like the very first days of mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA, and we didn't have all the answers then either. And so we're, we're still in this very early stage that will continue to develop. So I have a great-grandmother that was adopted almost immediately upon her birth. I have found her birth certificate, which actually doesn't have her name listed, but because of the time and place, I'm fairly certain it's her. It has a name for her mother listed, but the father is listed as not known. 
So we're looking at a birth at around the 1880s. So there are no real good records that exist at that time frame in this place. So I'm hoping that DNA will help me solve that question. So I've had descendants of this particular ancestor test, and now I'm just working through those matches to try to find the right individuals. The problem, of course, is that I'm working with a completely empty family tree. The benefit of testing with a family tree is that it's so much easier to find your most recent common ancestor with your matches. If you have no tree, then you're really working more blind. You're using things like places and times and, and you're looking for the right person that was in the right place at the right time and, and it's challenging. But I, I'm getting closer and closer and I, I feel like the next couple of years especially because so many people are testing. I know I'm going to find that one close relative I need to get that answer I'm looking for. So I'm spearheading a project that's looking at the amount of DNA that's shared by known relatives. It's called the Shared Centimorgan Program. And uh, what it's trying to do is it's gathering uh, relationship data and segment data from individuals and compiling that to get information like the, the range of sharing by known relatives, the average amount. Because when you get a result back and you're looking at, for example, the amount of DNA you share in common, you don't have a good feel for where that fits in among various other people who have that same relationship. So how many third cousins share X amount of DNA, for example? Are you about average there? Are you an outlier? Or does the amount of DNA you share make it vastly unlikely that you're actually third cousin? So we're, I'm working to compile that information and create easy to use charts and diagrams that people can use and rely on to, to ask and answer those types of questions. So if you're brand new to DNA and you've just bought a kit, you've sent it back, you've gotten that email you've been waiting for that your results are ready, I guess there would two, be two things I would suggest. First is check out your ethnicity results. I think they're a lot of fun. Keep in mind they're not finalized, they're subject to change as the science gets better. And the second is, most importantly, focus on your close matches first. It's easy to get lost in your match list, particularly as you go on for pages and pages and, and you see all those wonderful surnames that align well with what you have. But really the, the key to figuring out and, and resolving your questions and finding matches is to focus on your closest matches first. That's, I think, the real key to, to working with genetic genealogy results.